New York, 1977. I hear somebody walking, and he hears it too, on these little pebbles coming towards the truck. No knock on the truck. I get the gun, I cock it, and I put it towards the window. He whispers a little bit above a whisper. It fits a cop. Shoot him before you kill me. I can't even believe what the fuck this guy is saying. And I, I'm by the window. It's my guy. Then I hear the knock. He forgot to knock at the back, and he knocks when he gets close to the window. Sam, well, we got to talk to you. I look at him. You want the mean to shoot the cop and then kill you? Yeah. Yeah, that's causing an ostrich, Sam. I wanted him. I wanted him. I didn't want to die first. No. I wanted him to die. And then me. I wanted to watch him. The fuck kind of a guy am I got here? I tell Louis Molito, I tell my guys, nobody's happy about this hit no more. Nobody's happy. Nobody's smiling. Nobody's doing nothing. I got him 13 hours. He's with me 13 fucking hours. In 13 hours, I got to love this guy. I got the epitome of our life in this truck. For the first time ever, Sammy the Bull Gravano tells his story. This is our thing. Nikki and Joey come. Everything is cool. You got my gun? Yeah, we got it. We got it in the car. All right. I said, nobody come in the truck. Stay out of the truck, I want to talk to him. I go back in the truck, and I'm, John, I just on the call, you, you lost the decision, bro. I got to take you out. I'm going to make them come back in the van. I'm going to take you in the back. There's some weeds and stuff back there. And uh, I'm going to kill you back there. All right, Sammy. You're going to live up to your word with the shoes. Everything, every, everything. I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to treat you right up, like a man, right up until the last second. There'll be no pain. There'll be no suffering. There'll be no fighting. There'll be nothing. I have the utmost respect for you. As much as I can love somebody and goes on Ostra, I love you. I really do. It breaks my fucking heart what I'm about to do. But you understand, goes in Austria, I think better than anybody I ever met. And I think you understand it. I'm choking just thinking of this fucking thing again. It kills me every time I talk about it. <sighs> so we all get back in. Everybody's quiet. We take them in the back. They had a Staten Island dumps and there's weeds and high grass and stuff. All right, pull over over here. We pull over. We get out. The door slides open and I hear him. Sammy, Sammy. I turn around. Joe, pal Joe, he's got him by the leg and he's trying to pull him across the van. Get your fucking hands off him. Johnny, you want to slide out by yourself? Yes. Get your hands off him. Let him, and he rocks his way forward to come out of the van. He gets out of the van and he says, where do you want me to go? Just walk into the weeds at three or four feet. And uh, bend over. Louis Molito. This is Johnny Keys, Amiga Nostra, Agaba de Jean. 
This is Louis Molito, who's a friend of ours. He's gonna take you out. He'll do, he'll be the shooter. Thank you, Sammy. He's taking me. He walks over, he bends over. Louis Melito with a 357 Magnum, I believe it was, that he had. He hit him in the head, his body is down. He hits him two or three more times. Everybody gets in the van. We're all sick. We killed the epitome of our life that night. We all felt that. We all had so much fucking respect for him. It was like real, a real family member that we killed a family member or something. We got back in the van and left. Everybody went home. The next day, it was in the newspaper, mobster from Philadelphia, high-level mobster from Philadelphia, was found, killed gangland style, and blah, 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 all that bullshit. I had to go to Paul's house, which I did. I went there, rang the bell, op opened the door to the maid. As I'm coming in, Paul got up, he read the paper, He's running always, all excited. Grabs me, hugs me, kisses me. Oh my God, Sammy, you, you, you're the best. I don't say a word. What's the matter? Poor me or my crew, none of us are happy about this. This guy conducted himself that we killed the epitome of our life. Somebody that we're supposed to hold in high esteem. We killed him. He's taking Paul back a little bit. Anybody else would have did what you did would be on cloud nine. You know why? No. Every boss, every underboss, every gunslayer is going to know that our family carried this out. You, you, Sammy, they're going to know you carried it out. Nikki Scarfo is going to know you won the war for him. You did it. But you're not happy about it. No. Why? I don't give a fuck what they know. Well, if they're happy about it or whatever they know, I don't care. I know I killed the epitome of our life. This guy should have been the boss, as far as I'm concerned. And I just feel guilty. I feel dirty for what I did. He looked at me. He hugged me. He kissed me. Don't ever change. Be you. What you are right now, stay there. Stay in that aura. Think like you think. I love you. you but understand, you did what you had to do. You did what Goza Nostra told you to do. You're a man's man. But feeling like that and being man enough to say it, I think the world here. Stay like that, bro. He asked if I wanted coffee or anything. I didn't even want coffee. I didn't want nothing. So I so said, I'm just going to go back. I got some guys waiting for me, and if you don't mind. So we got over that, and I left. That's the story of Johnny Keys. New York, 1977. A lot of people ask me questions about my crew. How did I pick them? How did I build the crew? I didn't intentionally go out and pick people to build a crew. 
Some people I knew and grew up with and were around for years and years and years. I knew their families. I knew different people from the neighborhood who knew them. Stymie came to me one day and he became one of my right-hand men. Really super tough guy. Somebody came to me and said, this kid Stymie in Doc's bar had an argument with McIntosh last night. They actually pulled guns on one another. McIntosh was an Irish guy who was a Carmine Persico. I knew him from when I was with the Colombo people. He was deadly. He was deadly. I knew as soon as that was told that he'll come back and kill Stymie. For sure. No question. So I told the guy who told me about this argument, I didn't know Stymie. I said, he's dead, watch. A, a week, a month won't go by, he's dead. They both pull guns on each other? Yeah. And then they laughed and they both walked away from it. Yeah, that's exactly what Mac will do. But in a matter of weeks, Stymie will be dead. Mark my words. Then he told me, he said, Sammy, this kid's a good fucking kid and he's got balls. He's really a good guy. I want you to meet him. I went down to Doc's bar. I heard his name once or twice, but I didn't know. I went down to Doc's bar. I was introduced to him. I was made already. He obviously wasn't made. He was, Doc, he owned Doc's bar. We had a couple of drinks, we talked. I instantly liked him. I asked him about the beef with Macintosh and, and him. And he says, Sammy, I know he was a tough guy. I know he was with the Colombo people, but I'm not no punk bitch. I'm not gonna let anybody do to me what he did. If I gotta die for it, I'll die for it. That night, he opened up his thing, showed me a gun. I opened up mine, I got one too, motherfucker. What do you want to do? And we both pulled the fucking guns. You know Macintosh? I know of him. And I know who he was, I, you know, but I don't know him personally. Do you know how tough he is? How much work this guy's done? I've heard. And you still did that. Yeah. Yeah. I'd rather die a fucking man than live as a coward. But he hit a fucking bell in me that I said, I'm gonna help this kid. I went downtown in Carroll Street where they Colombo stayed. I used to go there myself and I went there and there was Macintosh outside I walked over to him and said, Mac, what are you doing, bro? Hey, Sammy, how you doing? How's everything going over there? Meaning with the Gambinos. Good. I hear good things happen for you. Now, he's not a main guy. I'm not supposed to discuss that. So I just said, yeah, yeah, a lot of good things are happening for me. And uh, I got to talk to you about something. What is it? I said, you went to a bar in Brooklyn, uh, in Bensonhurst. You had a beef with this guy Stymie, he's pulled guns and this and that. He's talking, he's smiling, he's laughing, and I'm talking, I'm smiling. I said, bro, I got this kid under my wing. I want to apologize to you. I heard what happened. He didn't know you from a hole in the wall. He's a tough kid. He's with me. When I told him who you are, he you know, felt bad about it, but you showed him the gun first, bro. This kid's a tough kid. And he didn't know, he's not showing you no disrespect, he didn't know you. He's not gonna let nobody do that. All right, now I got it. No, you don't have it, bro. He's with me. Do I have your fucking word that you won't hurt him? That's what you want? That's what I'll trust. I want your word. I want to hear you say it. 
Don't, let's not just blow this conversation off and he dies next week. I'm going to take that very personal. I'm going to take it like I killed him. I goaded him into some being relaxed for you. If you want him dead, tell me. Sammy, the way you're talking, bro, I love you. You know that. I give you my fucking word. I won't touch him. It's over. But you're right. I would have killed him. That's all I needed to hear, bro. I love you. I grabbed him. I hugged him. I kissed him. It was over. That's how Stymie wound up with me. When I got done with Macintosh, I went right back to the bar to meet him. I told him, stop carrying the gun. The thing is over. But you got to listen to me from here on in. What I did, I put my neck on the line for you. Don't act like no fucking cowboy doing stupid shit. I read him the riot act. He became so loyal to me over the time, years. He became one of my top shooters. He was for real. Another guy in my crew, the old man Peruta. The old man Peruta, I knew him already for years. Great guy, street guy all his life. He was older than us. He was 59 years old, I think, when I was in my 30s. And he was with Tato. He had cancer and was dying. I made Peruta on his deathbed. John was in jail. I sent word to John, he's dying of cancer, I want to make him. John said, go ahead, get some captains, put him around his bedside, prick his finger, take the blood, do the ceremony, and make him die as a friend of ours. That's exactly what I did. Peruta was a shooter as well. He always looked like an old raggedy old man. And that's what we used to call him, the old man Peruta. Even though he wasn't that much older than us. He would kill somebody for me as fast as somebody would get me a cup of coffee. If I said, do me a favor, get me a cup of coffee and Guy would walk over. Well, that's all I had to do with Peruta. It was no different. There was a guy, Michael the Bat, who was part of my crew. I knew his father, Mackey. He was a gambler, in debt all the time. And I always used to take care of him. Just get the wolves off of the door. You know, if you don't pay me, I'm gonna break your face. Leave him the fuck alone. And I used to tell guys, but he was, that, that was him. There was guys like that. He wasn't a tough guy. He was just a neighborhood guy who's always seemed to be around me and ran to me with problems all the time. And I took care of some of those problems. When he died, he had a, a, a big debt. He had a little bar on 18th Avenue all the way down. I think it was his daughter, or someone came to me and said, they're going to his wife and his kids and going to collect money that he owed. Who's doing that? A bookmakers, some street guys and stuff like that. I didn't think that was right. I got in the car and I went to his house. I went to the funeral for respect to the family, I knew the wife. So I went and talked to her. There was this big kid there, he was in college, football player, big serving a gun. He was ripping mad that guys were there, he wanted to defend his mother and this and that and all this shit. His sister was there, a daughter. I said, listen, listen, please, all of you calm down. Roseanne was the, I said, Roseanne, Keep quiet and go sit next to your mother. You, big guy, keep your mouth shut. You're not gonna do nothing. 
You're physically big. When these guys come, if you do something stupid, maybe you could win. You look like a tough kid. You're going to get hurt. You have no idea what you're fucking with. So be quiet. Then I told her, from here on out, whoever comes here for money for because of Mackie owed the money, say, okay, don't argue. The lawyers, don't argue. Just tell them, Sammy's paying those debts. Go see Sammy. Send them to me. That's all you got to do. Don't argue. What are you going to do? Michael said. I'm going to not pay them, number one. And I'm not going to let them bother your family. Your family, you guys don't owe these people money. Your father gambled. That debt dies with him as far as I'm concerned. But let me handle that. That's my business. That's what I do. I'm not going to fight with them like you want to do. And I'm telling you, you won't win. You may win a fist fight, but you won't win. That's what I did. She called me back. I went back and she said, Mackey's bar, this little bullshit bar, on 18th Avenue, it was a shithole, really. She said, they, we don't, we're back in the rent and this and that. I want to give it to you, if you want it. I said, yeah, yeah, I'll take it, I'll do something. I was going to open an after hour club with this place. So I took the club. No money, no transactions, nothing. A little while after that, this kid, Michael the Bat, came down to talk to me. I want to be with you. Yeah. Go to school. Someday we'll talk. I quit. I got a little injury. I quit. I don't think it was the injury, but he wanted to be there for his family, and uh, I guess he liked what I was doing. Whatever. Long story short, Michael the Bat hooked up with me and was another guy who was 100% with me, physically very tough. Eventually, he came on work with me and just as good a shooter as anybody else. So my crew was building and getting stronger all the time. And it had a reputation. One example I'll give you real quick. I was made, my crew was by this place, Docs, and uh, John Gotti was made now. Not too long. John Gotti came down with a couple of his guys and he went to Docs. I wasn't there. And he started asking these guys about his sister's daughter. I was banging a few people. And he's getting a little rough. So Stymie tells him, listen, this is Sammy the Bulls joint. I don't know about what she does, what she don't do. I don't even know you. If you have a problem with your niece or whoever it is, it's not over here with us. And I'm telling you, he told him two, three times, about that this is Sammy's place. Knowing that it should be respected by another made guy or whoever the fuck John was, he didn't know him. John continued with his mouth. Stymie looked at Michael the Bat, eyeballed him eye to eye and nodded his head like that. That's all it took with Micro. Michael the Bat went in, there was a sort of shotgun under the bar for the bartender if there was ever a problem. Michael DeBat bartended once in a while. He went right in, got the shotgun, put it under this long coat. One or two guys peeled off. They were loading up. John picks up on it. He's not really stupid. And he calms down. John says something more. Now they're all loaded. My guys are loaded. Stymie tells him, listen, I told you four or five times this is Sammy's joint. We're with him. 
Now get in your car and take a fucking walk. I'm not, I'm gonna stop talking nice to you. Get the fuck out of here. John smiles and as he's walking away, oh, you wanna be a tough guy, huh? Go in the car and leave. He leaves. Then John comes to me and tells me the story. They told me the story too, but I went back after John's story. I heard both sides. And I said, Stanley, do you know this guy's a May guy? I heard. You heard he's a May guy and you did that? Yeah. You can't do that. Sammy, fuck him. He can't do what he did. Nobody could come here and fuck with you and think they're gonna walk away like nothing happened. That stymie again. I can't even be mad at him. I put on a bullshit act. Well, don't ever do that again. Walk the fuck away, it's no embarrassment. Walk the way, we'll get, I'll take care of it later. But I walked away with my chest sticking out four inches. My crew were fucking beasts. They didn't fuck with nobody. They didn't try to hurt people. They helped people. But if you fucked with them, you could die. And that's what the entire fucking mafia got to understand and learn. This was no easy fucking place, especially if you came there to fuck with Sammy. You might die there. So that's how I built my crew. I didn't go around looking for people to sign them up like it's a job. They fell into place here and there. Some of them I knew a long time. Some of them I felt what they were about. I just didn't pick up guys for numbers. There was a guy, Joey. I hung out with him when I was a ramper growing up. Him and his brother went away on a drug charge or whatever they did. They got 15, 20 years. 15 years later, he comes out of prison. And so I'm now not docs, I'm in tallies. And somebody comes and says, Sammy, this guy, Joey, Joey Senna was his name. Joey Senna's in the front, he wants to talk to you. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know him. So I went to the front, hey, Joey, how you doing? This and that, yeah, I just got out, and this and that, and whatever. I went having that kind of conversation. How's things going? Well, not that good. I just got out, I'm broke, and, but, I, you know, I'd like to come around you and hang out. I hear a lot of things about you now. Yeah, I don't know what you heard. You've been away 15 years, bro. I haven't seen you in 15 years. I heard a few things in jail. You fucked around with drugs, put some shit in your nose, right? I don't know where you're coming from anymore. What I'm gonna do, hey, Huck, come here. Huck was another one of my guys. And I lean to his ear and I tell him, go get 5,000 in an envelope. Huck comes back, 5,000 in an envelope. I said, hey, Joey, Put this in your pocket. Maybe this helps you, you know. And I can't put you with me. I got a crew. I haven't seen you for 15 years. I don't know if you're an informant. I don't know if you're wired up right this fucking minute while you're talking to me. I can't expose my people to you. I don't know where you're coming from anymore. Hang around the neighborhood. We already got a head start. We know each other as kids. I'll hear everything you do or don't do. And eventually, maybe one day I'll call you in. Maybe you could hang around me. I need time. I can't make that snap decision because I knew you years ago. All of a sudden, you're part of us. I can't do that, bro. These guys have been part of me for years. I know their wives, their mothers, their fathers, their uncles, their aunts. I know when they took a shit. I know who, who they fucked. I know everything about them. There's no hidden secrets. I don't, I, I, I think the world of you. You're a tough guy, you're a good guy. But I don't know those secrets anymore. There's 15 years 
of secrets that I don't know. Maybe you should think the same way. 15 years later, maybe I'm a different guy than when we grew up. I might be a motherfucker. You don't know that, right? No, I know you're not. All right. Give it time, bro. I never took him back with me. But that's what my crew was. I didn't go out just picking guys or picking guys for money. Most of them I got were broke eventually. I helped them make money before I wound up getting money through them. So that's what my crew was, and that's the reputation my crew had. Frankie De Chico knew them all. He loved them all. They loved him. So we had a lot of things, and that's what my crew was. When John Gotti and Angelo Ruggiero got in trouble with the boss of the fucking family, I'm one of the first guys he came to for help. That's another story I'll talk about a little bit down the road. New York, 1982. In 1982, I, I was doing great. I mean, I was doing construction, had a good close relationship with Paul Castellano. Everything was flying high, everything was good. I got this uh, disco, there was a few partners, and they had this disco. I bought the building, my office was underneath. It was My office was a 5,000 square foot office. And right on top, on the second floor, there was a club, the Plaza Suite. I had bought the building and uh, it was uh, really good. I was running my construction businesses out of there and everything was going good. Two guys, a guy named Vinny Sicilian in the Colombo family, a made guy, and a guy named Salty from Coney Island, another made guy. I don't remember exactly. I think he was with uh, the Genovese people, but I'm not 100% sure. They had these kids. They were with them. The Plaza Suite was under their protection. They would give them a piece of it. There was two of the partners really weren't with anybody. And they came to me with a problem one day. <sighs> that, that, that they were having with Vinny Sicilian and Salty. So I said, what's the problem? And they were being bullied a little bit. These guys were putting in bounces and all kinds of stuff and the bounces weren't doing the right thing and they're fucking around with the girls. They weren't really working and these two guys couldn't really make them do what they wanted them to do. So uh, I went to sit down with uh, Vinny Sicilian first and I told Vinny that these two kids were with me I understand you got this other guy, he's with you. The Salty's got another guy. I'm coming into the place. There's a lot of things I don't like about it. I own the building, they're right on top of me. They're not listening. You got a couple of bodyguards you put in there that think they're the bosses and they just fuck around with broads all night and they don't do their job. So uh, before I go and step to these guys, I want to show respect and come to you guys and tell you that I'm here now. And I want to ask if you have a problem with that. No, Sammy, no problem at all. You could take full control. All we do is we sit, you know, we don't even go near the joint. And we just get our end every week. We don't do anything. So you go in there, bro, control the whole joint, do whatever you want. Oh, great. Great, I appreciate it. I'll make sure you get your end every week. I'll make sure that you're getting your legitimate end that these kids ain't bullshitting you and I'll know what's going on. Okay, great. So I go to the place. I walk in with some of my crew. Stymie, Michael, the bad, about four or five guys. I walk in with. I called the bouncer over. It's a big guy. I said, uh, 
I forgot what his name is, but I talked to him and I said, uh, there was a fight the other night. You didn't even break it up. What happened? He said, first of all, who are you? I said, I'm Sammy, I own the building. I spoke to your men. And I'm gonna run the place now. So here's who I am. I'm the guy who told, who's telling you, get the fuck out, you're fired. You're not gonna work here no more. You don't have the right to do that. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. What I'm gonna tell you is go to your man, go complain to him, don't complain to me. Get out. I fired, I think, two or three people right away. I threw them out to show them I was in control of the place. These two guys, they were more timid than the ones I took. I mean, they were pounding their chest. They loved it. So I took over the place and I brought in Michael DeBat. I made him the head bouncer. I made Huck a bouncer. I put three more guys in the place, bartenders from bartenders to run in the place. This guy, Joe Skaggs, I made him the general manager who was gonna book any events that were gonna go on there and run the place and make sure the bills were paid, make sure everything was paid and all the money would go through him and whatever Salty or Vinny Sicilian's end was, he would make sure that it was put on the side and it was sent to them with my knowledge. Now, I was involved with a lot of construction, so I wasn't interested in going. It was a disco type of place. But I did go on a Friday. The place was packed. A line around the corner. And I, first time I went there at night, usually I'm there during the day with my office. I really didn't go to the place. I went in, looked around, it was gorgeous. Really, really well done, well lit, the lighting, everything was beautiful. So now I was controlling it. There was a guy sitting at the door who collect the money when you come in and he'd let you in. There was a rope there, real fancy, really nice place. So I told him, they pay you the money? Yeah. And what are you supposed to do with it? Well, then at the end of the night, I do this and I do that. How come you put it in your pocket? Well, that's where I put the money. There's no box or something that you put the money in. You put it in your pocket. You ever get confused whose money it is? Whether it's yours and mixed in with your money or to the place. And he laughed and giggled. Sometimes I laughed too. I said, that's great. I used to do this when I was younger. Sometimes I used to get confused too. Now, I didn't actually call it confusing then. I was robbing a few bucks for myself. So I called it robbing my boss. You know who runs this place now? Vinny is salty. Nope. Nope. I run it now. And I don't know whether to call it confusing, robbing, I don't know what word to use. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make you work in another part of the place. Cleaning up or doing a few things. There's a few chores that you could do. I'm gonna leave you on, but Huck, is gonna collect the money at the, at the door. I'm not gonna clean, okay? That's your choice. <sighs> so when you leave, don't let the door hit you in the ass. Don't come back unless you wanna clean. That's your job. So now he's gone. I'm controlling the door. I'm controlling the whole place. It's running smooth. There's no fights. 
The bouncers do what they're supposed to do. The waitresses, everybody does what they're supposed to do. A lot of the waitresses I knew from the neighborhood, so I knew some of them. There was entertainment, as Joe Skaggs would get the entertainment. Everybody was running smooth. Everything was going great. Eventually, Joe Skaggs came to us, me, mainly, and my guys. And he had a guy named Frank Fiala who wanted to rent the place on a night that we're closed. In other words, we operated Friday, Saturday, Sunday. He wanted to open the place on a Wednesday and throw himself a birthday party. It sounded strange to me. I said, why, why would we do something like that? And Joe Skaggs, I called him in and I was talking with him and he said, Sammy, it's an off night. I could get people coming in and uh, we'll make, you know, a nice score. It's going to pay for the booze that they use. He's going to give us X amount of dollars to have the place open. I mean, we could make a, day, a good day's pay out of it. It's a bonus. We're closed on that night. I said, all right, handle it. So he started making arrangements to do this, right? Then I started hearing rumors. The guy who's renting this place, I believe he was Czechoslovakian, and he was in charge of the Czechoslovakian mafia. Never heard of it. Didn't have a clue who they were, what they were. He was a multi-millionaire. He had a yacht, his own plane, all kinds of stuff. And he had this shipping company that if a ship in the ocean gets stuck, they would call his company, he would fly mechanics, parts, and all kinds of shit down to this ship, fix it, so it could keep sailing. Uh, he, he was in a position he was making a huge amount of money from that. It's a tremendous business. And I'm not talking about little boats, I'm talking about major ships, oil sh uh, tankers, all, all kinds of stuff like that. And there isn't very many companies that do that. And he's also in the Czechoslovakian mafia. Again, I never heard of it. So what does he want to do? He wants this party, he wants to bring in 300 people for his birthday party. In the middle of the night, he's going to sit in the middle of the dance floor and have women shave his head. He's going to buy food for them. He's going to have a raffle. He's raffling off a boat, a motorcycle, a car, all kinds of things. Now my greedy ass crew heard about this raffle and immediately they're talking to me about rigging the raffle. Let's rig it. How are we going to rig it? Now we'll figure it out. <laughs> I said, is that why you want to do this here? This guy seems strange to me. Why does he want to stop the whole place and shave his head in the middle of the place? Sounds nuts to me. Well, he is a little nuts, but uh, big Coke dealer. He's got, a, he's got like an entourage of people following him all the time, they're telling me. Give him broads Coke as much as they want, whenever they want. He had a pack of people following him all the time. I'm starting to think maybe we shouldn't rent the place out. And Skag says, you know, we could deal with it. We're going to have, you know, we'll put all the guys on, Michael the Bat, all the bouncers will be here. We could handle it. I said, all right. But I'm curious. I want to meet him. 
I go to the place, and there's supposed to be a meeting in the Plaza Suite. It's closed, it's during the day. And I go there. And he's just buzzing around. He sounds and looks like he's stoned out of his fucking face on coke. He's talking a mile a minute. He's got women coming over, sitting on his lap. It's, it's just weird. The whole thing is fucking totally weird. And he's not making sense. All kinds of things he's gonna do. He wants to bring in bands from Europe and this and that. And so I'm saying, well, we, we, we have a, a, a DJ. And I didn't say we, I said they. They have a DJ and you could use their DJ. We don't need no bands like that from Europe. I'm not gonna go, this is a one night thing. This isn't gonna be a lot of events and this and that. He don't wanna hear nothing. He wants to do what he wants to do. What kind of food, what kind of catering are you gonna bring in? Chinese food. We're gonna have Chinese food brought in for the whole 300 people and this and that and everything. So I grabbed Joe Skaggs and my guys, my brother-in-law Eddie's there and Stymie's there and Louis Melito was there. I said, come on, let's get the fuck out of here. I think this guy is nuts. So I grabbed Skag Skaggs, I said, listen, something is wrong with this guy. It's, it's, he's not normal, something is wrong. Did he give you a check? Did he give you a deposit? Did he give you money on this thing? Oh yeah. Sam, he gave me a you know, nice size check. All right, then, then do it. But uh, I'm a little concerned with this. I let the thing go. There's a couple of more meetings and things are said, it's more insane every meeting gets worse, not better. He's got people going with him on his plane, on his private plane, and he's flying them around. It's like a jet set type of thing. Not, it's weird, the whole thing is weird. I'm starting to worry about it. So I have a talk with my crew and I tell them, listen, come Wednesday when this place is gonna open, you know, there's gonna be a few guys, Michael and Huck and a few guys, and 300 people, if they're anything like him, I don't know if they could control all these people. We don't know who they are. You know what we should do? Maybe we should all go. Every one of us, go. And we'll get a couple of more guys, neighborhood guys, tough guys, uh, you know, hire them for the night. Let's, let's get about 20 of us in there to back up in case Michael LeBat has a problem or something. Let's all go. And that's what we do. That night comes, there's about 20 of us. One or two guys are armed. I feel I could take on an army. 300 people don't come. 100 people come, if that. And all kinds of weird shit going on. Guy is dancing on the dance floor, takes his pants down and everybody's cheering, clapping. They're family members of his, supposedly. We're sitting at different tables. I said, this is fucking nuts. I knew this fucking thing was gonna be crazy. I said, look how crazy this is. He did get on the dance floor, somebody shaved his head. The things he was supposed to raffle and bring outside the club, the motorcycle, the car, nothing was there. So when I talked to Louis Melito and them, this is a fucking scam, bro. This whole thing is a scam. I bet you that Joe Skaggs didn't cash that check. I bet you that check is gonna bounce. Something's radically fucking wrong. 
They bring in Chinese food. There's no utensils, no forks, no spoons, nothing. A hundred fucking people eating with their hands. I never seen anything like this in my life. I think I want to leave. I said, I think I've seen enough, bro. I want to get the fuck out of here. I never seen anything like this. This is a circus, bro. I feel like a clown that we're sitting here and this is a, a joke. One or two little fucking fights break out amongst them. The bouncer strained it out in two seconds. No big deal. We just sit back. Not a big deal. Nobody interfered. Nothing happening. It's, it's a complete circus. I don't even know f what words I could use. I don't know if it's 1 o'clock, 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning. I said, listen, bro, I've seen enough, had enough. I got Skaggs is over by the table. I said, I guarantee you that check. You didn't cash it? No, no. That check is gone, bro. That, it'll bounce. This whole thing is just fraud. It's a fucking fraud, bro. They made a fool of us. No, no, Samuel, see, he's, he's a millionaire. I don't give a fuck if he's a millionaire. He's just fucking nuts, too. So anyway, they go to him and they tell him, the night is over. You got, we're going to close. He tells them, no. No, I'll tell you when we're going to close. 